Welcome back. I'm Shannon from Knotted Threads Co. and I'm here to finally present my most recent pattern, the Rosy Sling. It's available now on my website and on Etsy and the links are in the description below. The Rosy features a unique three-dimensional front pocket, a slightly angled top, and minimalist strap connections that give a nice elegant look while still offering functionality. Your strap connection, which has two D-rings allows you to wear it on either shoulder and your nice wide webbing strap offers comfort. You could also make this bag fully clear as I've made it to fit within most stadium requirements. But this is a fall 2023. Those things could change at any moment. Now I do not include uh, specific instructions for changing this bag to fully clear in this video tutorial, but in the written instructions I cover it completely. I even write additional uh, sections to accommodate clear but it was a little difficult to implement those changes into the video tutorial without confusing non-clear sewists throughout the process. I've designed this bag to be domestic friendly and I've also labeled it as intermediate. You have a lot of gorgeous curves here and that's gonna mean that you're gonna need to do some easing. We have bound seams here, which means you're gonna need to do some binding, but don't let binding scare you. In this video tutorial alone, I give you 30 minutes of tips and tricks and I walk you through my whole binding process and how it works for me and how it can work for you too. And in the written instructions you get clear step-by-step -step photos of my process as always and a dedicated binding tips section. I really love this sling. I love making it and I love wearing it. It's versatile and I love that once you start making one it's really hard not to make more. It has great potential to feature your favorite fabrics and hardware and it's a great skill builder. I hope you love it. So let's get to work. So first thing I want to do is kind of talk about the material choice, the stabilizer choices, and some of the prep work that you need to do. Um, we're going to start out by talking about the materials. So this vinyl is a kind of medium weight sort of structured vinyl. This is the Light Smooth from Backstitch Fabrics. And this gray is the um, Saddle Smooth from Backstitch Fabrics. It's a really good kind of medium weight, soft, flexible vinyl. I really do like that. Um, I'm using waterproof canvas for my lining here and that is from Fabric Wholesale Direct. I am using cotton woven for my interior slip pocket I have interfaced that with woven interfacing and let's see what else. This is also saddle smooth that I'll be using for my slip pocket and front pocket trim and I will be using the waterproof canvas uh, binding method. So this bag will have a mostly solid body with an accent pocket, um, front pocket here. It will have a contrast front pocket trim and then on the inside will also be solid gray and then I will have the accent fabric in the same print but just in cotton um, for the interior slip pocket and I will also have a contrasting trim there and on the back I will have this contrasting uh, vinyl just to accent a little bit of the uh, print on the back side. So I'm choosing the woven slip pocket this time, so I have interfaced it with woven interfacing as I instruct. For my rectangle ring connector, I have already drawn my lines and fused my decafil light. Now I make note of this in the pattern um, and on the pattern pieces themselves. Um, it's very important that you make your center marking here on these two zipper panels. This will be your back zipper panel and this will be your front zipper panel. That you make these notches here or center markings on the zipper side of your zipper panels, right? So this will be the front, your zipper side, zipper side, and the back. This is what is going to create that top part of your gusset. And so if you're not really sure which is which, let's say you used a um, projector to cut out your pieces or you used um, your silhouette. If they nest nicely together like this then they'll be fine. If they aren't nesting well then you know that you are that's the wrong side to be notching. You only want to notch these two here that are nesting, okay? And you want to make sure that you're doing that on your exterior pieces and on your lining pieces as well. You're gonna, they should only be marked on those zipper sides and this is pretty much because when you're sewing that whole zipper kind of situation together, if you are marking both sides of these centers here, it's going to be hard to tell in that moment if you are putting this on, if you're installing the zipper backwards or not pretty much. And you really want to make sure 
that you're installing it correctly because it will affect the way that the gusset lays. And if you do one correctly and then you do the lining incorrectly, you will see that that will also give you some puckering and buckling and stuff like that where you don't want it to happen. For my zipper panels, I am stabilizing those with uh, Thermalam, which I believe is Pelon 971F. Um, you could use fusible fleece here. Um, really, a Thermalam is just a slightly more structured version of fusible fleece, but really your main structure is going to come from just the way the bag is constructed. When you're sewing so many seams all together at once, um, that's just giving bulk and that bulk is going to help structure it and then you're going to further bind it which is also going to provide more stability. For the rest of the main body I'm actually going to use foam as my stabilizer this time um, and the pattern I do write it for fusible fleece. Um, I do say that if you want a little bit more structure then you can totally use woven interfacing and then first uh, same size as your stabilizer and then use um, fusible fleece or thermalam on top of that. Um, my personal favorite is foam for this bag. I just like the way that foam slings feel. It's very lightweight um, and I don't have a problem fusing it. I did not write it into the pattern because a lot. I got a lot of kickback actually on the uh, Mayfield for using foam. Um, but once you learn how to properly fuse foam, you're not going to have any issues. I will separate the foam from that fusible layer before I actually rip off um, any other part of this foam. So like I see I can, I'm separating the foam from that fusible layer right there. And what that means is that I have properly fused my foam. It's not going to go anywhere. Not to mention, um, once I do my basting here of this middle panel, um, that foam isn't going to go anywhere. Um, so I don't really have anything to worry about when it comes to that. But I know a lot of people don't like foam and that is okay. So that's why I did not write it for that. But I just wanted to show you um, the version that I like of the Rosie. And so that's what I'm using today. So this is my middle panel here. And you can see I have this extra bit of stabilizer right here that kind of seems a little weird. It's in the seams. We don't understand it. But I'll explain this to you. So where you have your front pocket on your bag, kind of, I don't know if you can see that shape of that stabilizer there, but this front pocket area right here where you will be basting it on is going to have a different amount of bulk than this area right here. And if you didn't have this extra stabilizer, what's going to happen is when your bag is all finished, this area here is going to want to sink in just a little bit more to match the bulk depth of this seam where the front pocket is. And it really gives a rather undesirable appearance. And so Adding this extra layer of Thermalam here gives it just enough bulk to help it match the rest of that um, area or the depth of that seam. And that's just going to kind of give you a better appearance. It's not going to sink in as much if it does at all. Um, I've gotten really good results doing this. And so I don't say, I don't recommend you to skip that at all. Definitely fuse the opening stabilizer onto your uh, middle panel, which is what I'm holding now. Um, you can do it really before or after. It doesn't really matter um, before or after your main stabilizer. I just say to do it after in the pattern because you have these lines that you're going to be referencing that I have you draw to fully um, align and, and, and uh, place your stabilizer. So really can you can do it either way. I just did it first this time because I have such a bulky stabilizer. It's a little easier for me to fuse this just to my middle panel first and then fuse my foam on top of that. On your back panel, you cannot see more than likely, but there is a strip of Decaville light that is underneath this foam. And that is important because that's going to stabilize our uh, D-ring anchor. And so we want to make sure that that is fused between our vinyl and right in between the vinyl and the stabilizer. You want it in between those layers so that you're sure that you're stabilizing the vinyl um, with that Decoville light. Um, it just, it really is important to do that. And again, on my gusset, I will be using, my bottom gusset, I'll be using foam. Make sure that you are notching all four sides of your middle and back panel. Um, it is important here to do that now because we're going to be using these side centers as uh, our landmarks for lining up our gusset 
Um, and same with the tops and bottoms, honestly. So it's important to do that now. Don't skip on that. You can mark it if you want. I did put uh, center markings on these pattern pieces if you'd like to reference those, or you can always cut notches. I just instruct to cutting notches uh, for this pattern because it's just a little bit easier. So I've done that on my exterior, and I will also need to do that on my linings. One more thing to note, I know that if you have purchased this pattern, which thank you, and you are you have put cut all the pieces out and you're ready to move on, I just wanted to show you that these pieces are not the same sizes, and so if you are working with, with a middle and back panel that are the same sizes, then you have cut something wrong uh, at some point in the process. And it's going to be the same for your stabilizers as well. Four different pieces here, and I know that seems like a lot, but with the way that the bag is designed, it's unfortunately the name of the game. For your front pocket, you have a lot of options for uh, material choices for your front pocket. So you can go clear, woven, uh, vinyl, and you can actually skip the front pocket altogether if you really wanted to. Um, the real confusing part about the front pocket is when you're cutting it out. Now on the pattern pieces, I have helped you kind of guide you in cutting it out properly so everything's oriented so you're not accidentally cutting this opposite of what you need it to be. It's mirrored and that's just, that is what it is. But when you're cutting everything out, especially when you're adding interfacing, it gets a little bit more confusing. So I've shown you a little bit of the prep work that I call for, for the front pocket. And that's gonna be to draw your half inch lines here from these edges. And this one's just on my exterior. And I'm tracing my darts. You can see I had my pattern piece off slightly. And so you can see the difference that it makes in your dart here. So I just kind of colored in the actual um, notch that I need to be, that butts up against the side that I need to be following when I line them up. But it is important to draw these darts. Um, I know that I could have totally had you cut them and just use a seam allowance, but I think that this is a little bit more accurate. Um, even if you're off slightly, it's not going to make a huge difference. Um, but if you aren't sure where to start and stop a dart seam or anything like that, um, this kind of takes that guesswork out of it for you. And it also helps you align your interfacing here, your stabilizer, which I have you cut the darts out of. You see we didn't cut it out of our material, but we did cut it out of our stabilizer. And it helps you line it up. All of this uh, stabilizer will be out of that seam allowance throughout that whole process, except for right here when we do the slip pocket trim, but that's not getting sewn into the seam as you see it's left out there. So not a big deal. It also helps you recognize kind of your limitations of where you should be sewing your darts and um, yeah, I, I really like how that turned out with the stabilizer and hopefully it helps you. Now, even though I am using vinyl, I still am going to stabilize it with the Thermalam. Um, I just prefer the feel of stabilized uh, vinyl like this. It's a little bit less kind of loose and uh, flimsy. And so I really like and prefer it stabilized, even if I'm using waterproof canvas as my lining. Also, I do tell you that it's important not to use Decoville light for this front pocket, um, or really pretty much anywhere. You are going to be doing a lot of manipulation of, you know, your gusset to kind of work around these curves. You're going to be turning your bag right side out after you've bound it. Uh, this front pocket is going to get squished a little. It's a three-dimensional pocket, and so it will kind of be scrunched slightly in the process of turning it out. It's also really hard to press perfectly. Uh, but most importantly is that I used this bag um, with a cotton woven front and I stabilized it with woven interfacing. And then I also did um, Decoville light for my stabilizer further. Um, and then I traveled with it and I really disliked um, what happened to that front pocket with Decoville light. It was very, um, it felt like paper, it got dented in versus like kind of gets smushed and then it pops back out um, like it does with Thermalam. So it was really just undesirable results all the way around. I know people will use Decovillite and that is their choice to do that, but I just can just speak to it from experience of not only making it and sewing it and trying to press those wrinkles out, but also using it and knowing the appearance of that bag later. I do prefer fusible fleece and I do not recommend Decovillite. For your hardware and notions, you will need inch and a half wide webbing. Um, you'll need about a 52 inch length 
of webbing. Um, you can definitely take away from that or add more to that to your leisure. Um, example, I'm a tiny human and I need to cut off about 12 inches of webbing to make it comfortable for me so that my tri-glide isn't sitting all the way down to my uh, snap hook when my strap is being worn. Um, but other body types may need to add on 12 inches. That's the beauty of webbing is that you have the ability to do that without piecing anything together. You simply just cut it longer. This is going to be about a yard and a half, so if you bought a two yard cut, then you can always just cut more. You will need number five nylon zipper tape. Um, I give you the links for that in the pattern. Um, you definitely don't want to use metal because we will be sewing over these edges here um, when we install the bottom gusset. You'll need an inch and a half wide tri-glide, rectangle ring, and a uh, snap hook. You can also use an inch wide uh, swivel snap hook. That's completely up to you. I give you options for both in the pattern, but for this tutorial I'm going to use inch and a half. You'll need two one inch D-rings um, if you're going to add any fun labels or logo labels or any other fun additions to your bag. Those are optional. It's just what I'm going to be adding. And two number five nylon zipper pulls. All right, to get started with construction, the first section is the front pocket and middle panel. So you will need your uh, fully prepped uh, front pocket exterior, front pocket lining, uh, middle panel exterior, middle panel lining, your uh, front pocket trim, and any embellishments that you would like to add. Now everyone can laugh at me because when I went to fuse my uh, thermalam, I used a new pen and when I spritzed it and fused it. Um, I have a very nice, unique front pocket now. So there we are. We have that. Um, yes. So, <laughs> but I've traced my darts and all that good stuff. So I'm good to go. Again, if you haven't done those center notches, please do those before we get started and make sure that you're drawing that center line on the back or on the wrong side of your uh, front pocket trim. So I'm first going to get started with the, just the front pocket exterior. Okay. So the first thing you're going to do with these darts is you're going to pinch them together, right sides together on those little sections there where the dart is and there's no interfacing. And you're gonna try and line up those two drawn lines there and you wanna clip it. So now we have this monkey piece here and um, what we'll do is we'll take it to the machine and we will just stitch along that drawn line. Hopefully yours is a little cleaner and prettier than mine, but you'll stitch from edge to point here. There's no seam allowance or anything like that. You're just stitching directly on top of that line. Um, you do have some wiggle room here. It's not gonna be a big difference if, you're, if one side is perfectly on the line and the other one is not, or if you catch a little bit of your interfacing in there when you fused it and maybe it shifted slightly. There is some wiggle room here. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Um, but if it is too far off of that line, either inside or outside of it, then what's gonna happen is it's going to affect the way that this front pop, this front pocket opening here sits on your bag. It can maybe be too, too far out and then it is too flat against the bag, so it means it's gonna be tight for your hand to fit in there or it's going to gape open too much and it will never sit nicely close to the bag where we want it to. We want it to open up, just kind of have that happy middle ground of being just enough for your hand to slide in without gaping. Don't stress too much about being perfectly on the line, just try your best. So I have sewn up those darts and now you can see I have followed along those lines that I drew. Or maybe you can't see because my lines are so ruined, um, but I did. And I also did the same thing on my lining, which is what I instruct you to do in the pattern as well. And so it wasn't too hard to stay on the lines for me, but I've also done this dozens of times. So it is easy for me. It might be challenging for you at first. Just take your time. I've trimmed my threads and now what I will do is some trimming. Now in the pattern, the bag that I make for the instructions are, uh, it, it has a woven front pocket. And so because of that, what I tell you to do if you have a woven front pocket is to just press this to the side. And then this is my exterior, press your seam allowance for that dart to the side. And then on the lining, you would press it to the other side and you would line them up like that, right? 
But because we have vinyl and it's so thick there and we want to distribute that bulk a little bit more evenly, we're going to do some trimming and we're going to open up that seam because we don't have to worry about the tip of that dart fraying out from our stitches. So we are going to trim until we hit about, or we're going to snip, I should say, and open up that seam allowance there until we're about an eighth of an inch away from the tip of our stitching. I'm going to do that on these bottom two. And then again on the top. So I'm not going to do any further trimming on this top dart because it's just so small as it is and as you see once I open it up because it's a rounded edge it's not going to line up perfectly with the edge of the um, front pocket but and there's not a ton of bulk there but it does flatten it out and it makes it really nice and even for us to stitch over. For the bottom we will do that but we want to take away some of this extra bulk. It just doesn't need to be there. So I like to trim it to where I have about a fourth of an inch. And I kind of just meet where I stopped stitching there. So it's going to be just over about an eighth of an inch and then all the way up to about a quarter of an inch. Nothing too crazy, but just enough to reduce some bulk. I'm going to do the same on my lining. So now that I have uh, trimmed my seam allowances, I can now open it up. Now if you had a material that was easily pressed open, you could do that now. Just take it to your iron and press this nice and flat as well as you can. Um, but I'm using vinyl and no matter what I do, it's not really going to hold its press all that well without me risking melting the vinyl. It's not that big of a deal. So I just want to open it up when I put my lining wrong sides together with that. So I'll show you. So I'm going to open up both seam allowances like that and align that seam there. Alright, I forgot to mark my bottom center notch for my lining but everything seems to be fitting nice and smoothly down there. I'm just going to clip and then I'm going to attach my top dart. All right, and so now I have aligned my top darts here. And when I lay it down, you'll see that this doesn't fit really nicely. And so that's just because you have something inside of something else. So we would normally want to take a larger seam allowance. But when it comes to seam allowances and stuff like that, I would have to make a whole new uh, pattern piece for you for lining and I didn't want to go through that uh, to confuse everyone. So the easiest way to make this work is to just kind of allow the pocket to the lining to fall outside of the pocket where it wants to. That means I'm going to lay this flat and I'm just kind of letting my clip lift up and letting that um, material kind of fall outside of the exterior and I'm gonna that's just gonna kind of allow the pocket to be as snug as it wants to be now waterproof canvas isn't going to be as smooth of a fit here as woven will but just try your best all right so now you can see we have a nicer fit than we would have if we would have just made everything match up. So as you can see, hopefully you can, my lining falls just slightly outside of pretty much all of the edges and that's okay. So now what I want to do is I want to take this to my machine and base around all of these edges here using a 1 8 inch seam allowance. So everything has been basted and the pocket looks nice. It's a little bit it's not the most snug pocket ever, but it's totally, in my opinion, within uh, reasonable and <laughs> uh, expectations. So now I'm just going to trim away any excess lining so that I have nice edges to work with for the future steps. So 
So now that we have trimmed away any of that excess lining, we need to apply some double-sided tape along this uh, front pocket opening edge here. Um, we want to apply it about an eighth of an inch down. So I just like to kind of use my uh, basting stitch as a guide and just follow right below those stitches. Now you will take your uh, front pocket trim and you're going to lay it on your work surface with that center line pointing up or facing up. You're going to remove the um, double sided tape backing from your lining side and you're going to just kind of eyeball that center area and just press down to adhere it right below that line. Just want to show you that's where that line is right there kind of just visible. I'm not passing it or anything like that. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move up this trim to match this edge. It's going to cause this trim to want to kind of be wavy up here and that's okay. We want that. Just continue to do it. I like to work from the center out. So I worked from the center toward the top and now back down toward the bottom. So when I lay it down, you'll see that waviness right there. And maybe if I hold it like that, you can see it, but that's okay. So now we want to remove it from the front. And starting from the center again, just pinch it down and fold it over. So I like to give it a little seam roll before I go, just to make sure everything is nice and smooth and fully adhered. And then you can place some clips. Your clips are going to serve two purposes here. One, they're going to make sure that everything stays nice and snug up against that edge of the front pocket. You don't want a gap between the edge of the trim and that edge of your pocket. Uh, so you want to make sure that when you're pressing your clip on there, you kind of feel it kind of hug that very snug fold. And you're also going to verify depth of your um, trim and the consistency of that. So it's just a good way to have easy visual reference. You can see on the back it's also consistent. So now what you'll do is you'll take this to your mach machine and starting on one of these edges you're going to backstitch neatly and so along this edge right here, not the folded edge but this cut edge of your um, front pocket trim using a 1 8 inch seam allowance. Again, backstitch neatly because if you backstitch too far and you didn't do a, it in a very neat way, then um, it will show in your finished bag. Okay, those are my very not so perfect stitching, but that's okay. We're going to trim this away. If you're afraid of cutting that front pocket, then just reach in to that trim and snip just one side at a time following the edge of your pocket and you don't have to worry about cutting your pocket then. So now that our front pocket is ready to be installed on our middle panel, we can go ahead and move on to that step. If you are going to be adding a uh, embellishment in that pocket opening area, I suggest that you just leave the lining out of these next few steps and then after you get this installed, um, then you would re based everything onto that lining piece. And that's just because it's really hard to get a perfect placement for uh, whatever it is that you're going to be putting there because so many things come in so many different shapes and sizes, installation, holes, prongs, everything. And you want to make sure that whatever you're doing is clearing your seam allowance enough to where it's not going to interfere with your presser foot and it's not going to sink too far inside of the pocket. And the best way to do that is to put the pocket on first. And it's still completely manageable. For installing the front pocket, I just use clips for this. I don't typically need to use staples unless I'm sewing with clear. If I'm sewing with clear, clear is a little bit harder to work with. It doesn't really hold under clips. It, it's harder to stretch, all of those things. So you may find it easier to staple instead of clips. So we're going to match up these bottom center markings. And that's a very important landmark for both pieces. So you may want to double check your center marks before you actually start this process. And then as we go, we're just going to let the pocket go where it wants to. We're not going to fight it in any way. You see, it's going to hug that curve nicely. 
And then we're just going to continue up the side. I missed a section to trim. So it's important to make sure that your front pocket is nice and the lining and the exterior is flush so that you can make sure that you're aligning your pocket correctly. So everything is now clipped and you'll see that it kind of has a lot of extra space and it's kind of maybe sitting a little funky. If you have clear it might be doing something like that and that's okay because when we sew those seams when we construct the bag it's going to pull everything down and that pulling of those seams is going to give us that nice smooth front pocket that we want. So now you can baste around this whole front pocket using a 1 8 inch seam allowance. You don't need to baste outside of this area. Um, and if you had, if you're not putting an embellishment here, again, your um, lining would already be installed on your back. You'd have already basted it as per the instructions in the pattern. So, uh, but I'm going to do it after this because I have a cute little soot sprite that I need to install. All right, totally just went through those instructions and uh, forgot to hit record. So um, now that you have based it on your front pocket and if you added the embellishment, you have done that now. Um, normally I have been putting duct tape on the back of my hardware, but I have this um, old peel and stick foam. It's very uh, similar to craft foam. Um, it's about that thickness and I have found that to be more desirable when I'm masking something like this. Um, it just tends to be nicer when somebody's reaching their hand inside of the bag and their knuckle maybe grazes that hardware. Now they're just grazing another piece of foam or something soft and it just seems to work really well for me. Um, but duct tape works as well. And then, so now we can just place our lining wrong sides together, align our four center markings, clip around this edge, and then we'll baste using a uh, 1 8 inch seam allowance. So now you have that uh, front slash middle panel all prepped and ready to go and you can set this aside. It's quite nice how quickly this comes together and you just get a nice little preview of what your bag will look like. So now we can move on to the rectangle ring connector and D-ring anchor. For this section you will need your rectangle ring connector, your D-ring anchor, your back panel exterior, one, one and a half inch uh, rectangle ring, two one inch D-rings, and two rivets. We're going to start off with the rectangle ring connector and the first step in that is to make some snips along these curved edges. So those snips were made and they're about and a quarter inch apart and no deeper than a quarter inch. And so now what we'll do is run some double sided tape. I'm using eighth inch here and that's what I use pretty much the whole pattern. And I'm going to apply it all along that curved line you drew that helps you align your um, stabilizer there, that Decoville light. And you can remove one of the backings and fold over. I like to start from the middle, especially any curve. I'm always going to start from the middle. And I'm just going to align that edge of the rectangle ring connector with the edge of the um, stabilizer there. Press it as well as I can. Do the same for the other side.
And then I like to seam roll this just to make it nice and smooth. Then we're going to slide on our rectangle ring, apply some double sided tape to one lower side. You could also use glue here if you prefer to do that. Um, because I'm just going to sew it here in the next minute, I just use double sided tape because I just need a temporary hold for now. But if you feel more comfortable with glue, you are absolutely able to do that. You just have some drying time involved here. Then fold it over to match these straight edges, like this. Then press, and I like to clip. I like to snip off these little wings down here. Now we're going to use our ruler and measure down from this folded edge about a half inch. And then using a removable ink pen or chalk, just draw a line there. You can do more or less than this measurement if you are comfortable sewing closer to the hardware. Um, or if you think, if, if your hardware is very thick and this is still a little bit too, that line is a little bit too close to that hardware for you to comfortably maneuver around it, you can always drop it down a little bit. Um, just be careful dropping it too far down if you're using thin hardware because then you just have this big gaping hole there for no real reason. Um, and we don't want that. We want it to be nice and snug. So I think a half inch is good and accommodates most hardware sizes and most feet capability, but you also may need to use a hump jumper here when you sew up and over and then you're getting ready to go back down. Your foot's going to be resting on this hardware back there and it might need a hump jumper to get back over. So now that we have everything adhered and we have our line drawn, what we'll do is we'll start at this bottom center point and then we're going to sew using a 1 8 inch seam allowance along this bottom edge, up this folded edge, across this line that we drew, and then back down, and then meet our starting point again. So now I want to remove this ink marking and we want to uh, find this bottom center. So now we're going to grab our back panel exterior. We're going to take our rectangle ring connector and we're going to align the center marking that we just made on the rectangle ring connector with the back panel top center marking and clip. And then we're going to base this on using a 1 4th inch seam allowance. I like to use a 1 4th inch here because when I do my basting of my lining to my back panel piece later on, it just gives me an additional row of stitching that's in a different location further in. Now that's basted, we can work on our D-ring anchor. On the wrong side, you want to place um, double-sided tape right along either edge of that uh, center line that you drew in the prep work. And then we're going to remove those double sided tape backings and fold in both long edges to meet that center line. So now we have folded those edges back. We can now top stitch uh, away from each folded edge, this top and this bottom, using a 3 8 inch seam allowance. It's going to give us two kind of centered lines down the length. So now you've done that top stitching, I would double check your needle. Um, if you apply the double sided tape really close to that center line, you shouldn't have sewn through it there or maybe right next to it. Um, but just in case, double check your needle, use some um, alcohol wipes if you need to, to remove any of your double sided tape gunk from your needle. Now if you are making a fully clear bag or a clear back, uh, there is a different method for you to use for the D-Rink anchor that is included in the pattern. Um, and there, if you are looking at the digital instructions right now, um, there is a link to those instructions there. It is very simple. It's just essentially you have to make some marks here on the wrong side, put the D-Rings on, fold it, and apply it onto your bag. Again, all measurements, all instructions are included, but for this tutorial, I'm going to stick with the non-clear version. In the written instructions, I tell you how far to measure up and over with your ruler so that when you lay your ruler down, you're measuring and tracing down that first one inch from the corner. And you're gonna do the same thing with your ruler flipped in the other direction. 
from that top inch. And that's going to give you a distance between these two vertical marks that you want, and it should give you consistent depth between the bottom edge of the back panel and the bottom edge of those lines. And the reason I tell you to do it that way is because measuring up and from a corner here or down from the side or up from the bottom to make these two vertical lines is a little bit challenging with rounded corners. So I find it easiest to do it this way. So now you will take a blade. This is a very almost dull blade um, and carefully open that line that you just drew from edge to edge. That's why it's important to just draw that one inch line. We don't want to draw um, outside of that because it's it can make your slot too big which also gives you issues. If you wanted to wait and do your rectangle ring connector until after you've done your um, D-ring anchor, you can definitely do that. I just wrote it this way first because um, it kind of keeps this part of your process done and completely over with and then you just move on to the D-ring anchor um, and then if you were clear you moved on to that and that would be kind of the end of those installation uh, techniques. It's just kind of the way that I arranged it but if you want to do this after you've done your D-ring anchor that's okay too. So now we've cut both of those slots. We can flip our work over and see where my slots are. I'm going to measure in one inch from each of those and I'm going to mark. They can be as sloppy as I just made them because they will not be seen. So now we're going to apply double sided tape inside of those one inch lines. So in between the line that we drew and the slot that we cut. Now, the more double-sided tape that you apply here, the more you're going to sew over it. So use your best judgment there. We want to keep this stable, but at the same time, we don't want to deal with gunky needles either. Now, what we're going to do is, if you're using directional like me, make sure that you are paying attention here. You're going to flip this over. You're just going to insert it into that slot that you cut. Now it should be a snug fit. You want it to slightly pinch your D-ring anchor here. You don't want it to be so loose that you have any kind of visible gap between the edge of your D-ring anchor and that cut slot. Most of the time one inch is fine but you may need to snip ever so slightly more so that it's not buckling it too much. Once you're sure that you have a nice fit there you're going to pull this uh, D-ring anchor to meet that one inch drawn line, remove your double sided tape backing, and then press to adhere. So when you flip it back over, you should be seeing that seam facing up. That way if you were to fold it over, you see the correct image and no center seam there where your two raw edges met up. Now what you'll do is you'll sew a box that's going to go across both the back panel and the uh, D-ring anchor. So you want to use a 1 4 inch seam allowance from this cut edge on both the back panel and the D-ring anchor and you want to use an 8 inch seam allowance from the edge of the slot down. I don't know if you can see that with the line I drew but you're gonna you want to stitch a little bit closer to that that slot right there but you definitely want to stitch further out from this cut edge. It's just more secure. Make sure you're back, back stitching well. You can back stitch here when you start, go over, back stitch again a couple times there, totally fine. If you want to go back and do additional stitches that are an eighth of an inch away from this cut edge, you can totally do that. You can secure this to your own preference, but just know that this box right here that I instruct you in the pattern will still hold. Um, but I know that some people want just a little bit more reinforcement and that's okay too. So I'll sew, that, sew up that box and then we'll move on. So now you can see I've sewn that box. I did do some back stitching on both sides just to give it a nice and secure hold there. And you don't even need to remove any of your markings if you drew it like I did first. You can leave them there, but this is the back side. You'll see I've had ample room to catch both sides of my seam there. And because I've sewn that box, I don't have any gaps and no holes in my um, back panel. So now we need our two D-rings. We're going to slide both of our D-rings on. 
And then what we're going to do is insert the other end of the D-ring anchor. Now when you're inserting the second side, you want to make sure that you're not pulling any of the back panel into the back side and having it buckle over. You really want that nice kind of, you want to allow this D-ring anchor to point this direction on the back side and you want you want the back panel to lay, lay nice and flat and not buckle in on itself or fold over on itself in any way. So now we can remove these double-sided tape backings and adhere our D-ring anchor. So now is a little, it's a little tricky because you're going to do the same exact thing you just did, but you're going to do it on this side, which means that when you're sewing it, you're kind of going to be acting like this, which is going to bend your back panel a little bit, but after it's installed, you can, before you put on the back panel lining, you can absolutely press this nice and flat. So I'm going to do that now, and this time I'll bring you with me to the machine and you can watch me stitch that box now that the other side has already been attached. Well, I brought you there and you were sitting there, but you were not recording. So I am sorry about that, but essentially I did exactly what I told you to do. And you can see pictures of it in the pattern. And uh, I just sewed this box. You can see this one, I accidentally went a stitch too far. That's all right. Honestly, it's going to be covered by the hardware, but still um, you want to try and keep it like I said, an eighth of an inch away from those cut edges just so that you keep it as nice and clean as you want. So now you can do what I did, which is pull your D-rings to either side. And some of you are probably saying, Shannon, you forgot a step that you wrote and you are correct. And I forgot to put my double-sided tape down here in the center. So I'm gonna do that now, which is it's a lot harder to do this. <laughs> Um, if you don't do it when I tell you to, but I don't always listen to my own rules, so here we are. So that double-sided tape strip is going to just hold this nice and flat. It doesn't need to be perfectly centered, um, your double-sided tape, but you do want to try and get your D-ring anchor as centered as you can. So I remove that double-sided tape backing and I press this down to adhere. Just know that if you did it just when I did, you're more likely to put it in your stitch line at some point, but um, yeah, don't do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> um, but now what you're gonna do is just look at the bottom. Now that you have placed that down, just see if everything looks to be nice and even. Uh, make sure that your D-ring is hitting the same spot on either side. Make sure that that gap seems pretty even. Now I instruct you to measure in from this folded edge and draw a vertical line. So do that for each side. And that's gonna be the reference points that we're gonna to use to start and stop stitching for our box that will then secure our D-ring anchor down. So go ahead and draw those lines and then what you'll do at the machine is you will start at one of these corners or bottom edge. It really doesn't matter where you start. I just I don't suggest starting in the middle of one of these short edges. That's where I say don't do it, but you can start off center, bottom center, right on the corner, that's fine. What you wanna do is you wanna stitch a box and you're gonna use an eighth inch seam allowance from these bottom and top folded edges and you're just gonna stitch right over this drawn line on each side. So I personally like to start here and then I sew down here using a one eighth inch seam allowance up one and eighth inch seam allowance over, and then hit this, go down, meet my point, pull my threads to the back, and nut it all off. So now you can see I have finished with my stitches there. I have sewn from here, up, over, and back down. I used an eighth inch along these edges, and I started and stopped in the same needle hole. So now what I want to do is I want to um, just tie this off, knot it, and really secure those threads the best that I can. So now you have secured your threads. Um, you will mark your rivet placement. I give you measurements for that and the pattern. You can also uh, do a little closer to your hardware. It's really your preference. Don't go too far because I don't know if you noticed, but there's a nice gap right there between the box you sewed around that slot that you cut and the box that we just finished sewing. And so if you go too far one way or the other, you will puncture your stitches when you um, punch your hole, so don't do that. But you have a little bit of wiggle room within that area. 
So draw those marks, punch those holes, and then insert those rivets. So I've just inserted the back of those rivets and you'll see that they sit quite nicely in that gap. If yours ended up a little wonky down here like mine, that is okay. Sometimes it'd be like that, right? They can all be nice and pretty like that one. So now I'm going to set these rivets and then I'm going to give my bag a good press just to try and eliminate any of those wrinkles that happen when I had to fold it to install the other side of my D-ring anchor. So now everything's pressed and my connectors are done and I'm able to move on to the next section. But before we move on, I wanted to make a note of a couple things that were asked, um, but are not included in the instructions uh, because they're kind of like a occasional scenario sort of thing. So I didn't want to draw too much attention and confusion to it. So if you're using a woven backing, I suggest that you use the clear D-ring anchor versus this one that we just did in this tutorial right now, um, which is just the normal one, the kind of partially hidden um, D-ring anchor. That way uh, you don't have to worry about any edges fraying out over time. Uh, with woven you can imagine that that cut edge right there can maybe travel up and down and out and it's not going to give you the results you want uh, like it would if you used a material like woven core. I mean I'm sorry like a vinyl cork faux leather something like that. If you're using something that is very stretchy material um, and it will kind of stretch around a rivet. You may want to further uh, and reinforce that rivet right there. But in my experience so far, I haven't had any issues because if you think about it, you have four layers of vinyl just in the D-ring anchor itself, the layer of material that is on the back panel, a layer of Decoville light, and as well as um, whatever stabilizer you are using, thermal lamb, additional woven interfacing, plus, or, um, I'm sorry, foam, like I'm using today. So I think that you have enough support there, not only that, but also the way that we have sewn it on. But if you want to further enforce it, you are welcome to do that. Up next is the interior slip pocket and back panel. For that, you will need your exterior back panel, your back panel lining, your slip pocket, a slip pocket trim, two double capped rivets, and then if you want to add any fun and inappropriate tags or your logo label to the inside, you can do that. I know a lot of people like to put theirs on the outside. Uh, I, it's just my preference to put them on the inside. So the first thing we're gonna do is fold our pocket in half, wrong sides together like this, and then press. We wanna press to give ourselves a nice crisp, crisp fold down there that we can reference. Once you've pressed it nice and crisp, we're going to open that up and we're going to use that crease that we just created as a reference line to trace in the center. Now the reason why I don't tell you to measure in from one end or another is because interfacing can shrink, woven fabric can shrink, you can cut slightly off and all that good stuff. So this is just since we we want to work with two even halves, halves um, we want to make sure that we are finding the center of the piece as it has been prepped, okay? And so once we've drawn those center lines in the one inch sections, we want to draw a couple more lines. And I will get them drawn and then just show them to you after the fact so you can see what I meant in the pattern. So all the lines I just drew are going to remain inside of these vertical sections that we drew in our prep work. And so you have to measure up and draw a horizontal line, down and draw a horizontal line, and then there's a measurement from the edge of the slip pocket that is a vertical line that's going to connect those two. You can see it here, my uh, interfacing shifted slightly when I pressed it, and so you can see that vertical line right there. Those are the three lines that you need to draw. And so once you've drawn those lines, you're going to apply double-sided tape just inside of this vertical long line from this edge to that edge. You can do that for both sides. So now we're going to take our scissors and we're going to cut from the edge of the fabric along that first center line that we drew on that crease until we hit this vertical line right there. We don't want to pass that vertical line at all. We're going to do that for both sides. And now that you have done that, essentially you want to remove these two individual blocks here from the slip pocket. You want to cut 
those two vertical line or those two horizontal lines till you hit this center vertical line and that way you'll have this cut edge that's all the way to that line and you just remove those two boxes right there So now what we will do is we're going to remove these double-sided tape backings and we're going to first fold in these separated edges here to match that big long vertical line like that. And then you're going to take these long edges and do the same. If you have any um, frays that are coming, like if you're like me and you use woven, sometimes your fabric's going to want to fray right there, and that's okay. I expect that since we're going to be cutting right close to the edge like that. You just want to trim away as much of those frays as you can. When you fold it together like this, you can always apply a little bit of fray check on those areas. But this is going to be sitting down at the bottom of your bag, and the reason for this kind of angled corner down here is just so that we can have something that is, we just keep this pocket as far away from our seam as we can so we can still navigate around it without it affecting our press or foot or anything like that. It's not going to affect what we can put into our pocket. It isn't going to take away from anything. It's only just going to make it a little bit easier. If you didn't want to do all this, you can totally make a regular slip pocket. Just know that point of this pocket where we have it placed on your um, back panel lining, it may interfere with your presser foot as you go by, depending on the bulk of your materials. So now I'm going to do the other side and I will then give it a good press to maintain all of those folds that I just made using the double sided tape. So I've pressed it nice and flat. You can see we have these nice angled edges here that match up nicely and I'm going to apply some fray check on those little points there where I've snipped really close to the edge and just allow that to dry before I move on. So I've applied my fray check. I basically put it on these corners right here and that center meet up right there. It's not something that we really have to worry too much about because this is going to be sewn down. It's going to be down in the bottom of the bag and you won't really see it, but it's good just to be safe. So now I will baste along this top edge using a 1 8 inch seam allowance. If you want to put a fun woven tag in there, it's a great time to do that. You can place it wherever you want, but it's just easiest to apply it now while you're basting this top edge closed. So I've got that basted on, now I just want to apply some double sided tape. I'm going to apply it just below this uh, basting line on both the front and the back of our slip pocket. So now we've applied our double sided tape, we want to grab our slip pocket trim and then we're going to remove the double sided tape backing from the back of our slip pocket and I'm just aligning this right below that uh, center line that we drew on the slip pocket trim. I press to adhere. Then I'm going to remove the double sided tape backing from the front of the pocket and fold over that trim. I like to place some clips just to secure it. Now that you have secured your slip pocket trim, we want to top stitch away from this straight cut edge right here using a 1 8 inch seam allowance. Now I do make note of this in the pattern. Um, it's a good idea to use your clips to kind of quick quick reference the depth of your slip pocket trim just to make sure that everything is consistent. Um, that consistency is going to give you your best results and uh, it allows you to see if at any point it's dipping too short on the bottom or the front because if it is dipping too short on the bottom uh, then what's going to happen is that uh, you will potentially miss that in this next top stitch. So just make sure everything is as consistent as you can get it. So I've got my trim secured with my top stitching and now I want to flip this over 
and I have wrong side up and I want to take my double sided tape here I'm only using 1 8 inch I don't recommend using anything more than that because if you do what will happen is you will um, be sewing through it and it will be on the inside of your slip pocket for things to get stuck to uh, once it's in use so what I'm doing is I'm applying this kind of just along this straight edge here so along these two edges here I'm not going too far into that angled edge and then I'm just going to place it along this bottom edge here. I'm getting it really close to that fold so that I can keep it out of my seam allowance as much as I can. So once we've applied our double sided tape uh, as instructed we need to draw a line up from the bottom of our back panel lining. Once we've drawn that horizontal line we will apply or we will remove this double sided tape backing and then center it over that drawn line. That should be right, that measurement that is given in the pattern should be the bottom width between those two angles. And then you want to remove it, the rest of the double sided tape backing, and press to adhere. I like to give it a good seam roll just to make sure everything is adhered well. Now we will top stitch along these bottom edges here using a 1 8 inch seam allowance. Be sure to back stitch neatly and um, I prefer to start with long thread tails and end with long thread tails and just pull them to the back and knot them so I get the neatest finish possible. So uh, I will do that now and then we'll check back in. Now that I've sewn that slip pocket on I just need to tie off and uh, trim my threads here and then I will mark for some rivets and um, get those installed. So I have everything tied off and my threads melted so now um, you will make these marks here on your uh, trim. I just like to eyeball this. I make sure that it's kind of equidistant from my top stitching, my vertical and my horizontal top stitching and also centered on my slip pocket trim and I do that for both sides. And now that I have those marks I will use my uh, hole punch machine I'll hole punch through both of those and then I will insert my rivets and in between the back side of my rivet or I'm sorry in between the back the wrong side of my waterproof canvas and my rivet cap I will be placing some Decaville light scraps that I've punched holes in just for further support for that rivet. So I've got my rivets set. I made sure to put my Decaville light there so I can further support that rivet. My um, material did shift on me slightly. It kind of turned in a little bit when I was doing my hole punch. So unfortunately it's a little off there but that's okay. Nothing that I would consider a flaw. So now I'm going to get my logo on here real quick and then we will baste this back panel uh, lining to our back panel exterior. So I've got my logo on and now what I will do is place these right wrong sides together like this, align those center notches and clip. Alright, so now I will base this using a 1 8 inch seam allowance. Now that we have that basted, we can set this aside and we can move on to the uh, zipper panels. So moving right along, um, we are at the zipper panel and bottom gusset section. Um, you will need, for this section, you will need your front zipper panel and exterior and lining, back zipper panel and lining, your bottom gusset and lining, your length of a number five nylon zipper tape and two nylon number five zipper pulls. So we're going to start off with our exterior pieces first and I reiterate this uh, at the very beginning of this section that uh, really double check that you have your center markings um, just on that zipper side uh, notched and not the outer ones. Um, it's really going to make this process a lot smoother. So for each of these zipper sides, I want you to apply 1 8 inch double sided tape. As you go around these curves, I want you to just kind of like pull it slightly, kind of angle it where you want it to go and use your finger to smooth it out on those curves. 
This is a lot easier to do with one eighth inch double sided tape than any other width. And also using this specific width will keep it out of your basting and a zipper seam allowance. Next on the wrong side of your zipper tape, I want you to mark the center of this length on each side and within the seam allowance. I'm only doing this on the wrong side because it's just a little easier to um, see it, but obviously mine has bled through to the correct side. So if it wasn't on white, it would still be on the wrong side. So you can start with the zipper panel exterior of your choice, either front or back. I just tend to work front to back um, in this process. So remove the double-sided tape backing. And then place your zipper tape right side down, right on that center notch. And just press there in the center area just to secure. Now I want you to continue to feed this zipper tape just like you did with the double sided tape. As you go and you maneuver and manipulate the zipper tape, just press it slightly into the double sided tape. Don't pull or stretch or do anything of that sort. Just kind of guide the zipper and allow the double sided tape to manipulate it for you. And so now what you will do is you will baste this a zipper tape on using a 1 4th inch seam allowance. So I've got one side basted on. Again I use that quarter inch seam allowance because it will serve a purpose later but also I want to avoid that double sided tape. And then I'm going to grab my other exterior, my back zipper panel, and I'm going to do the same thing I just did. I'm going to remove the double sided tape backing. Now I'm going to align the center marking on my zipper tape with the center notch on my back zipper panel. And before I align the zipper tape along those curves and edges, what I want to do first is clip this to hold it. And then I'm going to take this and I'm going to align these edges here together. And I'm going to just press my zipper tape in place. That way I know I'll have a nice straight edge there and I will ease the rest of the zipper tape into the side, into the, the rest of the lengths and curves of the back zipper panel. I do like to clip just to secure it since there is tension that wants to pull the zipper tape away. I'm going to do the same on the other side. You can tug slightly depending on the material you are using. If it doesn't have any stretch, this won't work. But if it does have a little bit of stretch, sometimes it just kind of helps the zipper tape sit where it needs to sit and then it will recover. Again, it's going to cause it to bow. You see how it's buckling there and if I were to kind of make it stand up, it will have this rounded appearance and, and that's what we want. So now I'm going to again baste this edge here, this clipped edge, using a 1 4th inch seam allowance just like we did on the front zipper panel. So I have my zipper panels basted now. Now that I have both zipper panels basted, I can um, install my linings. So make sure that you are correct, selecting the correct panel. If you want to be sure, you can just lay it flat like I have it right now and just align it just to make sure. And then you will take your lining and place it right side down on the wrong side of the zipper tape. And that will wedge the zipper tape between both the lining and the exterior. You're going to first align those center markings. Then you're just going to continue to ease it where it needs to go. I know that it's a little bit more difficult to do both exteriors first and then do both linings, but I've found that you really get the most consistent results on these edges here if you do it that way first. So now that everything is clipped, I will then take this to the machine and I will use my zipper foot to get a nice 3 8 inch seam allowance on the zipper seam. 
Make sure you're back stitching well and make sure that you're not using too long of a stitch length around these curves. Um, you really want to be using a construction stitch length versus a typical top stitch, stitch stitch length just so that you make sure that you're getting a nice smooth curve there and you're fully supporting the zipper. So I've got that lining sewn on and you see I went slow and steady and I don't have any wrinkles or buckles or any puckers or anything like that. I just went and followed my edge of my fabric and I got a great result. So now we will clip this back to expose the other side and repeat the whole process for this back zipper panel. So now I will sew this up using that 3 8 inch seam allowance. Again, I'm going to go slow and steady and I'm just going to make sure that as I go, no puckers form or anything um, so I get the best finish. So now that I have sewn on that second seam, I like to clip everything to be uh, wrong sides together to just look and get a good idea of my how everything lined up, that everything is even. Um, I tug slightly just to see consistency throughout make sure that nothing was uh, taken too far or too little at any point. Okay, my edges are lining up nicely. Now this next part um, I've coined as uh, Shannon's work, <laughs> which just means that it is work that you're going to do that is going to be tedious. Um, you're going to be like, why am I doing this? I don't understand. It's it's causing too much of a headache to me. And, and I get it. This part is kind of like the most annoying part of the whole bag. But it is important because we're dealing with a curved seam, right? We've got this like rainbow shape going on right now. And what that means is that we have to accommodate the seam allowance uh, material because that will, if we catch this... I'm going to show you on the back panel. If we catch this back panel as it is right now into this seam allowance right here when we do our top stitching, this is being stretched. It has tension on it right now because it was the inside of the curve and now it's been sewn and flipped up and so now it's got that smaller kind of diameter that it's trying to accommodate because it's like, well, I, you want me to go up here, you want to catch me where I am wider, but I really, I can't fit that. So we need to accommodate these curves so that we get a good result. And it's the opposite for this one where now we have too much fabric, right? So we reduced the space that it needs to fit into and so we have buckling and while you may think that it's hidden that buckling will show in your seam allowance when you top stitch it because it's just too much excess so we what we need to do is do some uh, snipping and some trimming of darts so the first thing I like to do I again I'm I always like to work front to back and so I'm going to remove the double-sided tape just kind of from this area here, a couple inches before, a couple inches after these curves, because that's where we're going to be reducing bulk. And so I know that this is a pain. Um, if you don't have very, very sticky double-sided tape, this might not be very annoying for you, but as someone who has, um, make sure my mic was on. As someone who has um, very sticky double-sided tape, it, it is a bit of a headache. You know how many of these balls of double-sided tape has been stuck to the bottom of my socks in my sewing room. 
I find it easiest to pull it off of my material versus my zipper tape. So when I am separating it, I'm putting my nail on my zipper tape and pulling away. I'm sorry, I'm putting my nail on my um, zipper panel and pulling it away from my zipper tape. This is also why I don't have you apply double-sided tape on your lining side for your zipper panels, just so that's one less step we have to do. So again, I'm working with this front panel here, and um, I start with the front panel in the pattern as well, so if you're following along with that, I will be making darts here. Now I do tell you first to make your darts on your lining. Honestly, as long as you know the area in which you are working with, you can remove the double-sided tape first and then work on snipping the lining. The benefit of leaving the double-sided tape is that when you go to move this and pull this down out of the way, you don't have to worry about that uh, zipper tape popping up and getting in your way. It secures it out of the way while you're snipping your darts. I just like to do it all at once since I've got my scissors in my hand and I just do what I have to do. So again, I'm going to move my zipper tape down as well as my exterior. I'm going to be starting a couple inches before this curve here and I'm going to snip some darts. They can be big. Um, you really want to kind of get as much of that material removed as you can. Just be very careful and do not cut into your stitches. If you cut into your stitches here, um, you will have to redo some sewing. It's very important you do not cut into your zipper tape. Um, I know that some people do it and they have no problem with it, but for me, um, if I'm using this bag and I'm loving it and a year rolls by and all of a sudden my zipper tape starts to fray out of my seam, then um, there's no saving that bag unless I'm going to redo a whole bunch of work. So I want to make sure that I'm just doing what I can to give me good results and avoid ruining something that will not, uh, that I want to last for a long time. If you want a faster version of this, you can always snip like this. I find it less consistent, and so I don't tend to do it often. So now that we have done our, our darts on our lining side, we flip it over and we're going to replicate those darts on our uh, exterior side, but we're going to do that only within the seam allowance of the basting, uh, of the basting seam allowance. So that is a quarter inch between the edge of your stitches and the edge of your fabric. This one's a little bit more challenging to do, and it's a little harder to keep your um, zipper tape out of the way, but I promise once you're done with these darts, the, the other side for the back zipper panel is much easier. So I've got my darts snipped on both sides, and what I'll do is I'll pull it together to show you, and then we'll see if I need to widen my darts or anything like that. So now when we look in here, we see there is a very small amount of buckling that happens, and mainly that's happening because I am not holding this as nice and smooth as it will be when it is top stitched. But there's no major buckles. Um, and it is pretty good to go. I may go in and add in a dart here. That's at that apex of the curve, and it looks like I just made it too wide. So now on the back panel, back zipper panel, you will be snipping the same kind of area that you did for the darts. Now you're just going to make snips, and by snips I just mean um, like this, cutting right into the zipper panel. You can go about quarter inch apart, and this is the lining I'm doing first. And see how much easier it is to move when you don't pull off that double-sided tape because it's still stuck to the exterior, the zipper tape is. So now that I know where I need to remove my double-sided tape, I can do that. You see I need to go a little bit further here. 
and then I'll just pull it again away from that exterior. So now I want you to take this to your iron and give everything a good press. As you are laying it onto your ironing mat or board or whatever it is that you're using, I want you to hold down one side to the best of your ability and I want you to press this lining away from your zipper tape. And that's going to fully expose that zipper tape so that we are making sure that the edge of our lining is going to match the edge of our um, exterior and it's going to make sure that because we're using such a large seam allowance um, we are or yes a large seam allowance and we have such a narrow opening for our zipper we are giving it the most space that we can so after you have pressed everything clip it all wrong sides together Now that I have it all clipped, when I sew this at my machine, as I go, I'm just going to make sure that I'm not pulling it forward or backwards, but I'm just going to make sure that I'm kind of making sure that everything is kind of pulled and exposed here. Because there's a chance as you're going that your exterior may want to kind of recede back closer to the zipper, and then you're going to top stitch it at that location versus maybe fully exposed. So just make sure that you are kind of keeping everything nice and taut as you go. So we've got our nice top stitching going, or at least somewhat nice. Mine's a little wonky. Nothing like sewing on camera to mess with your concentration. Um, so everything is nice and even. I've got my lining fully exposed. We're good to go. Now we can put on our zipper pulls. So I'm starting out with a nice straight edge here. And when I put my zipper pull on, I want to make sure that it after I put it on that the, my straight edge will be maintained. And so if you can see here I'm one tooth down and now my zipper pull is slightly crooked. So I want to take that off and redo it. So now I have a nice even edge there. My zipper pull is even. I'm going to do the same on the other side. When it comes to gussets like these on any bag, if I'm sewing the gusset like I am, or the zipper gusset like I am right now, where I have two equal panels on either side, and um, I'm just sewing zipper tape onto uh, zipper panels, I do not put on my zipper pulls until after I've done this, uh, after I've sewn them up, because you just don't really need to, and it just helps keep them out of the way. I like to zip them to the middle, and there we have it. Now we can trim our zipper tape from each edge and then re singe that tape so that you don't have to worry about it fraying out. So these zipper pulls are really neat and you can remove this charm by pushing this forward. So I'm going to do that now so I don't have to worry about them dangling uh, for the mic or while I'm working. So the next bit of work is going to be some more Shannon work. Um, it's going to involve some folding, some snipping, some marking, all of these things um, just to kind of help reduce the bulk uh, and give us a nice smooth clean edge in which to bind. So I'm going to place this right sides together and I like to first clip on my zipper tape. And then I just fold these in. 
So now when I take this to the machine, I'm going to stitch from this edge using a 3 8 inch seam allowance to right before that uh, seam, um, seam allowance right there. Again, I'm going to start or stop depending on which way you'd like to do it, but I'm going to start or stop right before that zipper seam allowance and I'm going to go all the way down to this edge. Okay, So both of these using a 3 8 inch seam allowance, make sure that you're back stitching uh, on each end when you start and finish. So I've sewn along that edge using a 3 8 inch seam allowance, so now it's going to be time to do some marking. So what I will do here is I will pull my zipper lining back, my zipper panel lining back, and I'll get this corner here. And I'm going to use a 3 4 inch marking on the edge of my ruler to create a box, and I'm going to trace that box onto the wrong side of my zipper panel lining. You do this for both sides, just like that. So we've got both of them marked. Again, that was measuring in with my ruler, 3 4 of an inch, and just tracing the corner of my ruler. And then on my zipper panel exterior side, I'm going to use my uh, interfacing here, my or I'm sorry, my uh, stabilizer here as a reference to just snip vertically into my seam allowance. Now I'm only snipping my zipper panel here. I'm not snipping my bottom gusset. And I'm just eyeballing this, but I'm making sure that I am not snipping into my stitches there. I don't want to snip into them at all. So as you can see, I'm only snipping like that. Do the same on the other side. So now we're going to apply some double sided tape. You're going to apply it right here on the edge of that seam allowance that we snipped on both sides. And then we're going to apply it, really doesn't matter where you put it, you can apply it on the inner part of this um, corner that you drew, this box, or you can put it on the edge of your fabric that corner right there. Both going to have the same effect and serve the same purpose. Remove those double sided tape backings and fold this point down to match. Same over here. And then you're going to fold down this seam allowance like that. Do the same on the other side. And so this is what you will have now. You'll have two folded sections that you can see there like that. And then you'll have your lining folded back on itself. And so then what we'll do is we'll place our lining piece back down, right side down, and we'll clip. And so then I'm going to make sure that I'm sewing with my exterior um, wrong side up like this so I can see these stitches that I made before. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sew from edge to edge using a 3 8 inch seam allowance. Now the important part to note here is at no point do you want to sew short of the your previous stitch line because what will happen is this starting and stopping point is going to show in your um, finished bag in that gusset. You'll kind of see the stitches show through so just make sure that if you need to sew just a scant more than 3 8 inch, that's totally fine. It's not going to make a difference in your bag, but you want to make sure that you are sewing just past those previous rows of stitching that you did. Make sure you backstitch well, and if you want to, you can also backstitch over this zipper just for a even more secure gusset right there. So as you can see, I've sewn across that top edge using a 3 8 inch seam allowance. And then what happens when you fold it back is that you're going to get a really nice, everything from the outside appears like a normal gusset. On the inside it's going to look a little different uh, because you have these folded sections, um, but all of those will be hidden in your binding, okay? So it, it, but what it does is it evens out your bulk there. You can feel the difference in bulk between this edge where we did that uh, origami folding and even just past that where you feel um, that area that has no folding in it. And really what it does is it just smooths it out and makes it more easy to bind um, without any major bulk in this area. And so you can apply this in pretty much any um, gusset installation that's similar to this. Um, it, it should work just fine. 
although you may need to alter it slightly if you're using a larger or smaller um, seam allowance. So now we will do the same thing um, on the other side. So we're going to clip our exterior and our zipper panels together, do our folding to get it out of the way, clip here, remember stitch this side, this side, do your folding, again your snipping, folding, place it lining side together and then sew across that and then you'll be in the same boat as you are now. And seam there. So now we have one big gusset loop. We're going to flip it right sides out and we are going to top stitch along each bottom gusset edge using a 1 8 inch seam allowance. Make sure that you are catching both the lining and the exterior when you are top stitching and be mindful of the bulk as you go over your zipper. We have top stitched each bottom gusset and now we will need to baste both the lining and the exterior together on your zipper panels and on your bottom gusset on both sides. So our gusset sides have been basted and the, when I baste, um, let's say if you were sewing any other circle, you might think to go around this way, then flip it over, and then go back around this way. But for me and for gussets like this, I have just found that if I am going this way on one side, instead of flipping it around and going in the opposite direction, because that's what you would be doing, um, I like to just move it over on my machine and just stitch with this on my left side of my foot versus my right, which is what I normally do. And I have just found that to be helpful. Not as much for these because these don't really need all that. They don't, there's enough going on in the middle here to where it's going to prevent major traveling. But if it is, if your stitch line is pulling it this way and then you go back this way and your presser foot and your stitches are pulling it this way, it's going to give you maybe some wrinkles or pinching in opposite directions that you don't want. Um, and so when I've, I've found that just when I go the same direction, just I'll first stitch this way and then again I'll move it over and then stitch on this edge, then I get a better gusset seam here with no traveling or anything of that nature. The end is near. We are at the final assembly. And so for this you will need your assembled middle panel, assembled back panel, assembled gusset, and your two strips of binding. So the first thing we'll need is just our assembled middle panel and our uh, assembled gusset loop. I'm just going to call it the gusset loop from here on out and this is your middle panel. So I'm going to flip them to be wrong sides out. And before we move on, I wanted to make note of which is the middle panel assembly section and the back panel. So the smaller curve will fit the smaller middle panel this opening right here and the taller one the back panel will fit again the back panel and so I'm going to match up my center markings here on that gusset seam on both sides and then I'm going to just mark my centers of the top and bottom of each side So now I will break out my handy dandy stapler and we will start by aligning both the top and bottom centers. Again, we're going to choose the side with the, the smaller curve. That would be this one, the inner. We're going to start at the bottom. We're going to line up the center marking on this uh, middle panel with the one on the gusset and staple to secure. I like to use my basting stitch line as my guide of where to staple. Then I'll do the top. It's going to feel really tight at first and that's okay. It, need, it hasn't been eased yet and that will happen momentarily. Unfortunately my camera went out of focus there, but what I did after I stapled that top center mark right there. I went and stapled these side seams, okay? And so 
all of this bulk here between the folded lining, the folded um, zipper panel, and then this slip pocket trim should all pretty much be evened out where your stitch, where your needle will go at 3 8 inch in. Okay, so at first it seems a little bulky and there is a lot going on there, but you will have, um, it will be evened out when it comes time to sew it. So again, line this gusset seam with that center side notch. And do the same on the other side. So now that you have stapled pretty much your four landmarks, you will then continue to staple along these straight edges. As your gusset pulls away from these rounded corners, you want to stop stapling there. And then we're going to address all of those rounded corners at once. So I'm going to keep stapling and then I will bring out my scissors to snip and ease the gusset. So that's about as far as I can staple. And what I want to do now is take my scissors and I want to snip into my gusset, not my middle, not my middle panel, but my gusset. And I'm going to snip just enough to snip through my basting stitches and um, release that pressure and expand that gusset. It's especially important to um, snip through your stitches if you're using bonded thread and you base it on your industrial. There wasn't a lot of layers there so it probably cinched it slightly and it will cause it to kind of be an even tighter gusset than it needed to be. So once you've done that, then you're gonna pull this down and we're gonna expand it to fit that middle panel. Then we're going to staple it in place. And we have a nice perfectly eased gusset there and we're going to do the same on the other three corners. So the less stretch that your material has that took me like five times to say. <laughs> um, the harder it's going to be to ease, but it shouldn't be impossible. You should have enough room here to make it work. Clear is a little harder um, to ease, and that is why in the listing I do say that uh, a fully clear bag is going to be a little bit more on the advanced side of intermediate. I don't think it's in an advanced bag, but I do think you need experience easing gussets and working with fully clear before you jump right into this pattern and make this pattern out of fully clear. So now we are going to base around this middle panel using a 1 4th inch seam allowance. Now that is different than other basting seam allowances where I tell you to baste at an eighth of an inch. And that is just because, that's for a couple reasons actually. One is we want to uh, make sure we're catching all of our layers. And two, we want to avoid our um, staples as we sew. If we were using our basting stitch as a guide, then that would have put us for the basting stitch on the gusset as a guide or on the middle panel, that would have put our staples at an eighth of an inch. So sewing at a fourth of an inch is going to help us completely avoid them. But lastly, because we are going to be doing binding after we do basting, if you are sewing close to but not directly on your future stitch line, you're gonna be maintaining everything at a really, really nice, precise placement that is close to what it will need to be when you sew your full seam allowance. And so it just makes binding just a little bit easier, right? You're already compressing some of this fabric down closer to that seam, which means it might be easier to place and hold your binding, all those things. So I just find it more beneficial um, and that is why I instruct you to do that. And so for the rest of the um, bag for me, I'm going to be sewing on my cylinder arm. Um, which is just a free arm industrial machine and it's just easier for me and I get a better result when I 
do the things that I do in the way that I do them with my uh, cylinder arm. If you do not have a cylinder arm, you can absolutely complete this with a flat arm. You just may need to do things kind of opposite, where I may be sewing gusset side up, you may need to sew gusset side down or vice versa. If I'm applying my binding on my gusset side, you may need to apply it on your middle panel side. Because everyone's machines are different and your comfort level of binding is different, um, that is going to be up to you. Although I do suggest that even on a flatbed that you attach your gusset to your middle and your back panel, both with your gusset side up. So I'll be putting my needle down and feeding it around like this. And I'll do the same with my back panel. And that's just because I want to make sure that I can see that my gusset is, main, is, is staying on the edge where I want it to be and where I stapled it. And I'm not having it come out anywhere. Um, it's just, if you can see it, you can stop it. But if you can't see it, you don't know that. And then you have to go back and rip out stitches. And we don't want to rip out stitches in this process. So, that's enough rambling. Let's go baste. As I get close to my gusset seam, I like to kind of pull my gusset back a little bit as I go. And that should help me make sure that everything stays aligned. If you did staple right over that seam, it might have been too thick of layers just right there on the edge for your staples to go through fully. So it's just something that I just like to do to make sure that I'm not, my gusset isn't getting sunk in um, at that point more than I want it to. Once I hit this point of the top part of my middle panel, I like to just unzip my zipper so that I can freely move it out of the way. As you come to your slip, uh, your front pocket trim, just be mindful. You may need a hump jumper to get over that seam. So we've done that quarter inch seam allowance all the way around. I'm gonna go remove my staples and then we'll move on to binding. So I've removed all my staples and now it's time to move on to binding. Now in the pattern I offer you two methods of binding and I go into detail as well as include a bunch of tips at the beginning of the pattern that you can apply to your binding at the end of the pattern. Um, and then as well as when I'm going through binding at this point in the pattern in the final assembly, I walk you step by step through how I do it. So. Um, a couple things about kind of bag making that makes binding hard from what I've found is that one, we have very thick seams here. Now if you're making something like a quilt or something that is using mainly woven, like cotton woven materials, you're not going to get this really dense, almost quarter inch thick uh, material that you're going to be binding over. You're typically going to have something that's maybe about an eighth of an inch and you're typically going to be using um, a quarter inch seam allowance. But with bag making, that's not typical. That is atypical, right? Um, you are going to have thicker seams, you're going to be using bigger seam allowances, and you're going to be using materials that are much more um, sturdy. And so because of that, traditional binding doesn't or at least traditional bias binding doesn't always work for your use. Now you can use a bigger width, so you can not stick with half inch, but half inch tends to be what people think to use when they are making bags and using a 3 8 inch seam allowance. They believe, oh, that's more than enough, that's what I need. But if you're buying store-bought, you're buying one that's an inch and three quarters wide and not two inches. And that I've just found like I've bought them and then I have tossed them because for me and my seam allowances and just the consistency of binding that I want, I'm not getting the results that are as desirable and consistent as I want them to be. So I have just personally found that using a two inch strip of fabric and I do not cut it on the bias and you'll see why as we sew. And so I make it two inches wide and then I fold it just like you would bias binding where you're going to fold it towards the center and then fold it again in half. When I start it off, I fold this top straight edge down to meet the side just so I have that angled edge. And it helps me feed it through here easier when I'm making my bias uh, tape or my binding tape, I should call it. Um, and I like the look that it gives on my finished bag and you'll, I'll show you that um, so when you were to put it on here and you'd fold it over then later, 
and then fold it over again. It really just distributes that edge and gives you a nice finish, um, and it's just my preference. For the waterproof canvas binding, um, I make mine kind of, um, it's like halfway between the single fold um, that some people use and the double fold, right? So it's more of like a one and a half fold. Um, so I make my strip an inch and three quarters wide, and then I'll sew it on, fold it over, and then fold it over again. And one side will be raw waterproof canvas and the other side will be a fold and I will top stitch them down. And this width gives you kind of ample room to uh, accommodate your bulky areas and bulkier fabrics. Um, and it also gives you um, a little bit more material to hold on to when you're trimming it at the end. Um, again, I'm not cutting any of this on the bias and you'll see why. Um, and it really works for me. This waterproof canvas option is definitely the more sturdy of the two options. This right here, this cotton woven that I'm using, it's not going to really give me structure. It's so flimsy. Even when I sew it on with four layers, it's only covering my seam. It's not really providing structure. So if you have a lighter weight vinyl that you're using, or if you're making a clear bag um, or a woven bag, and you just want more structure, I do recommend using waterproof canvas binding as your method of choice. Um, yeah, so I have rambled on long enough about binding. Let's actually get to it and you'll see how I apply it. And um, hopefully, while on camera, I'm not going to mess it up because I haven't been messing it up <laughs> before now. So I'm going to place my waterproof canvas right side down against my gusset. And I am going to kind of have it off center slightly. That's just my preference. And then I'm going to clip it in place just at the start. The rest I will not be clipping. So I'm putting my needle down close to the start of that angled edge and just making sure that I'm at my 3 8 inch mark on my uh, seam allowance guide. And I'm going to start stitching. So that's all I needed that clip for. And so then I'm just going to, as I go, I'm just going to be focusing on having the edge of my bag up against my 3 8 inch line. And as I go, as long as I'm focusing on that and then making sure that my binding isn't going further than that, I should be okay. I know that that is a skill that you have to kind of gain over time, but once it gets easier um, as you do it. And it's a little bit more easier with waterproof canvas because it's not stretching and being um, kind of manipulated in weird ways. It's going to hold its own during this process. All right, so I know that I'm getting close to my curve here. So what I do, and this is just something that I found that has worked for me in this process, is I'm going to snip along this curve. Pretty much where I would have snipped that gusset, I'm gonna snip along my binding. Now, I am using my finger as a guide and just opening and closing my stitches like this, or my scissors, not my stitches, my scissors. Um, and that way it's just a faster process. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow this straight edge here to ease around this curve. It's gonna allow it to hug it more than it would if we didn't do that, right? This is very similar to that, uh, to easing your gusset, to easing your top back zipper, zipper panel, you know? It's a curve and you're sewing a different curve on the inside than what is on the outside. And you're using a strip of fabric that needs to have that kind of tension released. And it's just going to give you an easier way or an easier um, kind of job when you're going around that curve. So then I just hold it in place, continue to sew, keep an eye on my seam allowance, take it one stitch at a time around these curves. And if you see it start to bunch up, just pull it a little bit. This is exactly how slow I go when I'm not on camera. So what I'm doing is kind of, I'm just making sure that I'm manipulating everything to be nice and flat for that next stitch. And I'm continuously doing that every stitch that I need to.
You're dealing with a lot of layers here, but they aren't impossible layers. So now we've gotten around that curve. We have a nice straight edge we can continue down. If your binding is going outside of the edge of your bag, you're not going to be able to see if you're following your correct seam allowance. So make sure that you aren't having that happen as you go. So I just took it carefully over that um, gusset seam right there, but because we have done that bulk reduction, it wasn't a big hump for us to go over. Although you may want to use a hump jumper if that makes you feel more comfortable. So now I'm hitting that area where, again, I'm going to have a curve. So as, I'm just going to show you, if I were to try and ease this waterproof canvas around this curve here, it's not going to comfortably do it. It's going to want to pucker and all those things. So again, I'm going to snip around this curve. And I'm just going to take it all the way for like a while because I know I'm going to need to do it again shortly after I hit that top center mark. And it's not going to hurt to have these snips even if it's on a straight area. Okay, that should be enough. I'm hoping I have enough because I accidentally cut this slightly too short. We're going to see. You're on this journey with me. Okay, so again, I'm going to continue around. Now, it's important that during in this area of your middle panel, you aren't pulling on your binding that much. And that's because there are less layers here. And so if you are tugging and binding on this area, especially if you have clear, where we don't have that extra opening stabilizer, it's going to give you maybe less than desirable results because you are forcing it to do something it doesn't want to do. I am only just kind of guiding it and keeping um, some tension, but I'm not pulling anything. I'm not, not really fighting this in any way. Taking my time and I'm just allowing the fabric to guide me. So again my zipper panel is still opened and then I'm going to keep an eye on where this front pocket trim starts because I want to make sure that I'm not just going to blow right over that especially if I have a domestic. I want to keep that in mind and maybe use a hump jumper if I need to. So right now I'm getting ready to sew over where that dart is on the top of the middle panel. And so there is extra bulk there, so I need to be aware of that. Just make sure that I'm going slow and steady and maintaining my seam allowance and my binding as I go. Okay, now I'm approaching that curve and I'm going to snip and it looks like I'm gonna have the exact amount of binding that I need, which is perfect. It's important that your snips are not um, any deeper than about a quarter inch so that you don't snip into the seam allowance and have that snip show through that 3 8 inch uh, stitch line. See how much that waterproof canvas is separating there? And that's how much it wants to, but it wouldn't have been able to had I not snipped it. Now you would be doing this exact same thing if you were using uh, woven binding, um, but just definitely be very careful about snipping woven um, any further than a quarter inch because you definitely don't want that fraying out. We don't have to really worry about that with waterproof canvas, but it is absolutely a concern with um, woven if you snip too far. Snipping a quarter inch while you're using a 3 8 inch seam allowance is totally fine. So now I'm reaching the beginning point of my binding and so there's a couple more things that I do to finish off this binding nicely so I'm going to just continue to sew just a little bit further until I kind of am normally I would have a little bit more of this to work with but of course I don't this time so I've hit that kind of beginning starting point and I want to get a little bit further and then I'm going to do something a little different so I'm going to snip this at an angle kind of close to where my needle is right now and then I'm going to pull this down. And I'm going to match it up with this edge right here. And that's going to kind of pull this down. And you'll see what happens when we fold it over later. 
Um, normally I also cut an, this to be an angled edge, so I don't have to worry about that corner popping out. But because I'm working with such little <laughs> excess binding, um, hopefully it turns out well. So I'm just going to finish now. I'm still following my seam allowance, which is going to put my stitches right in line with where I need them to be. I'm going to back stitch well, and then we'll look at my binding. So this was my starting point right here. And then I have followed it all the way around my edge. Nothing's really poking out all that much, so I'm good to go. But it is a good idea before we, where'd my scissors go? It's a good idea before we move on um, to, if there are areas like right here where I'm starting and stopping my binding, where it's just kind of sticking out a little bit more than I want it to, I'm just going to trim it down. And that's just going to help me with consistent or with consistency throughout my binding. So for woven um, binding, that whole process was essentially the same as it was for waterproof canvas. Um, and the next part would be is where things kind of differ a little bit between the two. So now I'm going to fold this back over on itself and I'm going to kind of tug as I go. Because we have such a nice tight snug binding, we should be able to see already the kind of nice structure that gives us. So now I've went through and I pulled this binding back on itself like this. And as I go, I'm making sure that I'm pulling on these corners here, these rounded corners, because it tends to want to sink down a little bit, but I don't want that. I want the nicest, snuggest binding that I can have. And you can see right there and right there that those areas that we did the this is now covered by our binding okay so it fits quite nicely in there so we still get the benefit of the bulk reduction but at the same time um, we're getting a nice consistent smooth seam right there so now we will just fold this over we're going to wrap it around that um, seam allowance right there and we're just going to clip it we want to make sure that we're getting the most snug fold that we can so I, am, I made a full vinyl, which is going to be a thicker seam than what you would have if you were making something like a woven front or a full clear. So just keep that in mind when you are uh, binding, if you are not using this method, you, if you decided for an all vinyl option and you're using a different binding method, um, just make sure that you're using enough binding to cover those bulky seams. And just like any other time while I'm working with curves, I like to start from the straight edges first and then work my way into the curves. And so you'll see now, see when I pulled down that second, that would be this one, the second binding, or actually that's this one. This, when I, when I finished my binding, it was on this edge right here. And I pulled it in slightly right after I met the first layer of binding, the, the starting binding piece right there. And so now when I fold it over, I'm going to have a really nice consistent edge right there. If I didn't do that, then just the bulk of this extra binding piece would cause the starting binding piece to be shorter and it would look more like this versus nice and straight. That's just something I like to do and uh, it's totally optional. So I have most of my straight edges clipped here. Now I just need to work on my corners. But as I work on my corners, I'm making sure that I'm kind of pressing them out slightly because that seam allowance is gonna to wanna to buckle. I wanna make sure that I'm smoothing it the best that I can now before I do my binding stitch. And that's just going to give us the best results. So just kind of work it the best that you can. So everything has been clipped. I know it's hard to see on camera um, right now, but everything has been clipped. Everything is nice and snug. And you can see my consistency in my clips around my bag. 
And so now, since I have a cylinder arm, this next step is easy for me because I have the ability to kind of allow my bag to rest below my presser foot and I can just guide it as I go. But if you have a flat bed, you might find it easier to do it um, with your middle panel up versus your gusset up. Either way, it should work just fine for you. So if you're going to use a quarter inch seam allowance from this folded edge right here, you're still going to come up about an eighth inch short of this folded edge right here. And if you are using this guide with your gusset side up and you're using a 1 8 inch seam allowance from this seam like I'm going to do you will still get a nice seam allowance all throughout so I know that seems confusing again in practice it's a lot more easy to understand um, than it is me explaining it right now So let's hope my battery survives this process and I'm gonna get started So again, I'm going to be using about an eighth of an inch seam allowance from my folded edge of my waterproof canvas. And I do you go pretty quick on this one because it's kind of easy for me. Um, as far as like this has kind of made it, I wouldn't say foolproof, but it's made it a lot easier. And now it's just another process that I'm doing. It's not, oh my gosh, terrifying binding. Again, be mindful because we're getting ready to go over that bulk of the slip pocket or front pocket. As I'm going around these edges, you see I have my finger underneath because I'm trying to keep my binding in the same position and make sure I'm feeling for any puckers. Now keep in mind as you're binding that I like to say in the pattern, there's no such thing as perfect binding. But I think there's room and margin for error here. And I think that if we give ourselves a little bit of grace, we'll still have really good results. All right, I haven't flipped it over. I haven't done anything. So we can see this side of our binding is really nice. Oh, I cannot see because it's not focused. All right, this side of my binding is really nice. And let's see what the inside looks like. Consistent. I did get one pucker there. I'm gonna leave that. I think that is acceptable. And that's probably because that was when I was talking while sewing my last bit of binding. <laughs> uh, and that's okay. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to trim away the rest of this bulk or this excess binding here so I have a nice 1 8 inch seam allowance. Before I trim you can see that there's a difference in the amount of excess that we have in our binding and that is because um, it's just the bulkier area, multiple seams, multiple um, layers lining up and just makes a total difference in your binding. So even using the large piece of binding that we did, we still had minimal excess, but it's still within the amount that we want because we're gonna be trimming it down to a 1 8 inch seam allowance from this stitch line. And so I'm just going to use my scissors and I'm gonna kinda of start it first. You gotta be careful if you're using really sharp scissors like me because you don't want to cut into your material, especially if you're using woven. And we're just gonna neatly cut and trim away that binding and leave behind an eighth inch seam allowance. My battery's gonna die, so I'm gonna finish this and then we'll check back in. So I just trimmed away that excess there. I left about an eighth of an inch all the way around. There are no stitches falling off of my binding whatsoever anywhere. It has a really nice appearance. And if you wanted for an, an even cleaner appearance that maybe can be a little bit more challenging, you can reverse the whole process and you can have this nice folded edge on the inside here on your middle panel. So I wanted to show you kind of just the difference between um, the waterproof canvas and the woven. So this is my personal bag. I kept it and this is the one that I um, sewed up for the written instructions and you'll recognize it there. Um, so you would just treat it just like you did um, your waterproof canvas version. Um, I sewed it on the gusset first, eased it around the curves with the snipping, went back 
and then I just folded it under just like I did at the start of this one and ended my binding, right? So when it came time to fold it over, you would have already sewn down this section right here. So you would have these three sections left to accomplish the task of folding over this seam allowance and then folding under again so you have a folded finished edge like this and not a raw edge. And you should have a good amount to do that. And even if at some point that this basic fold right here with no space in between isn't enough, you can always just open it up just a little bit more and you're still going to get coverage. So it's important with woven uh, binding here that if you're gonna cut shorter than the two inches that I call for, there's a chance that it may not cover these bulky areas where the slip pocket trim is, or I'm sorry, the um, front pocket trim is or the gusset seam is. Those are areas where you need that extra coverage and so you just have to do what is best for you, but if you're going to use woven, uh, bias binding or prepackaged bias binding, just know that you might have some trouble getting full coverage on those bulky areas. So when it comes time to fold over that woven binding and you have that folded edge here, I want you to align it just past that 3 8 inch stitch line that you can see. Okay, See how mine is just past it? If I were to just push this back slightly, you would see my stitches. That's okay. I'm able to do that now because the bag is turned um, right, wrong side out, inside out. <laughs> and um, But when it's turned right side out, all of these seams are going to press on each other and those stitches will not be shown. And right now, your seam allowance is already good. We don't need to worry about that. You have your 3 8 inch seam allowance, which is your construction seam allowance. Now we're just covering those raw edges essentially. And so as you can see, it looks really good. No one's gonna be able to know that those stitches are just under those folds there. And it's the same on this side as well. Although this one, I was lazy and did not change my stitches back to the exterior color of my bag, but still really great results. And then when you take it to your machine, you're going to be stitching using a 1 8 inch seam allowance from this folded edge. And that's going to put you inside of your 3 8 inch seam allowance. And you're going to be catching this bottom side. Because we know that we are aligning this fold with where that fold is because we're using our stitches as our guide. And so if we're giving ourselves an eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit more if you want to be careful, um, you know it's just it's going to fall within your seam allowance. And so the whole time I'm stitching this, I don't see this underside, but I know that I'm catching it just by the fact of what it is. It works, I've done it a whole lot, totally worth it, and it gives you the chance to add a nice contrasting binding to your bag to tie everything together. So now it's time to move on to installing the back panel onto our half assembled bag. And so what you wanna do is you're going to repeat that process of attaching these tops and bottoms, but on these side seams, you want to make sure that this center side seam here is going to drop about 3 eighths inch below the center marking of your um, back panel. So if you're having a hard time figuring out where that 3 eighths inch line is that you need to be following to match up your center sides, you have this triangle here that's left over from our folding techniques earlier. And as long as you are accurate with your drawing and with your seam allowances, from this edge to this tip of this point should be about 3 eighths inch. And that should be enough for you to hopefully match up this edge right here with that center notch and that will get you where you need to go. So I'll staple everything and then I'll show you what it looks like once you're at that point. So I'm going to take this center notch here and just kind of align it with where that angled edge meets the uh, zipper panel exterior. And you'll see it kind of like points right to that notch and that's where we want it.
So throughout the process of sewing on this back panel, make sure that those D-rings on the inside of your bag are uh, pointing toward the center of your bag and not out. Um, once you start sewing, if you are sewing with your back panel like kind of on, flat on your bed, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. But if it's flipped over and they're a little loose on in the D-ring anchor, um, then they will be flipping back and forth. And that's just something to keep in mind. As you were going over this rectangle ring connector, this is another one of those areas where you just need to be mindful of the bulk and what your machine can handle. It should be fine as long as you are using a hump jumper um, to get over that section, um, but industrial machines shouldn't have any issues. The back panel has been bound and I have trimmed away that excess binding and it looks pretty good, right? So now I'm going to turn this right side out and then um, give it a good press all over and then we will finish up the bag by just adding the strap. So there we have it. It's all nice and pressed and all my wrinkles have been mostly removed. I think there's a couple on the back that I could work a little harder on, but so far this is great. So I wanted to point out um, how, why I love foam so much. So um, again, I just used my normal stabilizer pieces that I would have been using Thermalam on. I used foam in the bottom gusset, the back panel, and the middle panel. I stuck with my Thermalam on my front pocket as well as my two zipper panels. I really prefer just the look and the smooth lines and the stability and the weight of foam here. It really makes for a, an absolutely amazing feeling sling and you don't get any of the heavy weight that's going to come with some other stabilizers or building up um, 
that uh, stability with multiple layers of woven interfacing. Now again, the reason I did not write this into the pattern is because I got a really large amount of pushback on the Mayfield for foam, um, but, and a lot of people have a really hard time fusing it. So I just kind of wanted to say, if you can work on fusing your foam, if you can get that skill down, you will like the end result of a rosy with foam if you can get there. Um, and again, I didn't write this into the pattern, but I will be sharing it um, once it's released to just tell everyone like, like, hey, give it a try, give it a go, see how you like it. That's my high horse for foam, and we can move on to getting your strap attached. The final section of your bag will be strap assembly. So you'll need your finished bag, woohoo, very excited, woohoo, um, your one and a half inch wide webbing, and again, you can vary this length. I'm using one that's 52 inches long. And then you will need your inch and a half tri glide, and depending on which you selected, either a one and a half inch wide swivel snap hook or a one inch wide swivel snap hook. And if you're choosing the one inch wide, you will also need your one inch snap hook connector. I've not shown that, um, but it is included in the pattern, and I do give instructions on how to install that. It's pretty simple, um, but it is a little bit more work than just uh, opting for this option that I'm doing, which is a one and a half inch snap hook. Now before we get started on sewing the strap, um, we want to make sure that we finish these edges here. Now I'm using a poly blend so I can absolutely melt it and it's good to go. But if I was using a cotton blend, I really need to make sure that I am applying some glue or something that will fully seal these woven uh, threads so that they don't fray out over time. Um, it's really important to do this step. Um, if you're using glue, you will need to wait just a little bit longer after um, you seal it with glue to let it dry so that it'll be fully dry by the time that you're going to sew um, it on to your tri glide and your swivel snap hook. So I know that I have a directional, web, somewhat directional webbing, right? Some things are one way and some things are the other. But because I know that I have a Totoro on the top front of my bag, I want to make sure that Totoro stays upright. And so I need to do a little bit of mental gymnastics to make sure that everything ends the way that I want it. I'm sure that there is a quick hard and fast rule for this, but this is what I do every time. So I just play it by ear. So I'm going to do that real quick and I'll give you a preview of what we're going to be doing. And then I'll be able to see. Yes. Okay. So this needs to, to be folded that way. Okay, perfect. So what I will be doing is I'm going to fold this one end, whichever end I want to be at the top. I want to fold it wrong sides together. I just want to fold it back on itself. And you want to fold it about an inch or so, inch and a half really depends on what you are more comfortable with and what kind of presser foot that you have. Um, it also depends on what kind of tri-glide you have. If you have a tri-glide with a movable bar like this, we can move that bar closer to the end when we're sewing, so most of our hardware stays out of the way. But if we have a fixed, um, a fixed width tri-glide where that bar is permanently mounted in the middle, we can only move it so far out of the way of our presser foot, and which means we may not to get, we may not be able to get as close to it as we want. So just use your best judgment here. I give you kind of approximate measurements of how far you should be folding it over. This is really like eyeballing central here. If this is, I'm not only one who likes to eyeball anything um, if I can manage it, but there are some times where that's just kind of the best way. Use your best judgment for the materials that you have. So with that being said, I folded this over about an inch. I could probably go just a little bit further. And then I'm going to feed that fold up and over that center bar of my tri-glide. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this raw edge here and kind of butt it up close to, but not directly under. I'm going to have a tiny, tiny gap between that sealed edge and that uh, center bar of the tri-glide. Okay. So there is our tri-glide, there's our fold. So I've clipped it just to hold it in place. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it to my machine and I'm going to stitch a rectangle box right here in this area. 
I'm going to get as close to my hardware as I can, but if I can't get that close to it because I have a fixed bar, then maybe I need to move this fold down a little bit further. Give yourself a little bit more webbing so that you still maintain a nice kind of fold up there. But regardless, you need to stitch a box down here. Your seam allowance is going to be an eighth of an inch away from this bottom edge and from these two sides. And then you're just going to get as close as you can to your hardware and cross the kind of top of that webbing. Now you can do this from either side, it's up to you, but you may find it easiest to do it from this bottom side. So I've got my box stitch. It doesn't have to be perfect. It will take some getting used to sewing kind of, if you're starting here like I did, go down or go over, up, and across. Once you hit this point of going down, then um, leaving this kind of bar behind you can be a little challenging. But just give yourself some time, you'll be able to get through it. So now that we have sewn on that tri-glide, we're going to lay this on our work surface with the fold up. And then we're going to take the end of the webbing, the other end that hasn't been attached to anything, and feed it through our rectangle ring. So your rectangle ring should then now... So now we're going to take this free end and slide it through this end of the triglide that's closest to the bag, like this. So now you'll see that this folded area is going to be encased inside this loop that's going to go over your shoulder, right? And then we still have this free end here that's going to get fed back through the triglide, okay? So we'll have a nice loop here, and then this is where our adjusting comes from, okay, just by pulling on this. Now if you're using something like seat belt webbing and you're using a wide mouth tri-glide or strap adjuster, you may find that it is loose and it doesn't hold your placement of your strap that well. And that is kind of the nature of the beast of seat belt webbing. So you may want to consider maybe sewing something on here or using a narrow tri-glide similar to this to help hold your adjustment better while it's being worn. So now that we have our tri-glide on, we need to install the swivel snap hook. Now you want to make sure that when you're putting your snap hook on, that the clip part is going to be on top, just like that bump on your tri-glide where the webbing is, is also on top, all right? This is what it should look like on the bottom with the bar and that kind of, you see that bottom loop there. And on the top, we have the rectangle with the hump through it, and then we should have our snap hook up top. So now on this free end of webbing, we're going to fold it over about an inch, inch and a half. Again, this is your preference. And then we're going to fold that back over the swivel snap hook like this, and we're going to clip it. So now that I have it clipped, I'm going to do the same thing I did before, which is I'm just going to sew a rectangle. And actually, I think I'm going to make mine just a little bit less tall because I don't need it that tall. So I'm, mine's about an inch, I would say. So yes, I will sew that rectangle and then our bag is done. So I've got my box all sewn on. And something I didn't mention for the tri-glide, but I meant to, <laughs> was that um, for the tri-glide, you can totally... And for this one, honestly, as long as you're backstitching neatly, you can feel free to backstitch. Um, no worries there. I just pref prefer to start with long tails and end with long tails when I do uh, my stitching here and on my uh, tri-glide, just because I like to be able to knot it off in the back nice and clean and either melt that knot down to secure it or I feed the threads back through uh, my webbing and just kind of bury them in there and I'll show you how I did that. So I've sewn my box. I did backstitch a couple times just to make sure it stays secure since this is going to be a major point of uh, stress on the strap. I'm going to knot it a couple times. And so then I have this large-ish um, sewing needle or hand sewing needle and I'm going to feed it through one of my needle holes from the machine. Now depending on your materials this may be easy or hard. Um, I know if you're using woven material like woven uh, webbing it's definitely a lot easier 
This one, I'm horrible. I could use a thimble, but I just use my fingernail. And what I'm doing is I am pushing the needle through the layers and not pushing it through the front. You see it's coming out right there in between those layers of webbing. So then I'm going to trim these down and feed it through my needle hole. I've got all four layers there. And then I'm going to push it through even further. And now I'm going to try and pull it through, but most of the time I need my pliers. Yep. So I just grab my pliers and kind of give it one good shove through. And then once I hit this point, I just pull the thread. And there we go. Just kind of buries it a little bit more. And sometimes I give it an even further tug just to make sure that that knot has went behind my uh, material here. So I have a clean front, a clean back, and then I'm gonna just snip these down. Be careful you don't snip into your webbing. And that way it's nice and buried and nobody knows that you actually started and stopped stitching there. Now you can clip it on either D-ring for whichever side wearing you'd prefer. And then your bag is all done. Congrats on finishing your rosy sling. Are you planning your next one yet? You can find me on social media. All my handles are at Knotted Threads Co. Feel free to use the hashtag rosy sling and tag me because I want to see them. Thanks for your support. Feel free to subscribe, like, share, all that good stuff whenever you can. Thanks and happy sewing. When I was writing the pattern for Rosie, she was abandoned with her two kittens. And we rescued her, we got her fixed, we got her taken care of, we've shown her some love, and in just two days she goes to her new home. And guess what her name is? Rosie.